Hey, this is Brooks with Character Design Forge. I've always talked about how appeal is one of the most important aspects of character design, but I've rarely dove much deeper into what makes something appealing. But recently, I had something just kind of click, uh, a way to convey and express, uh, a way to kind of define as much as you can what appeal actually is. One of the problems with trying to define appeal is that as an observer, it's really subjective. But then as a creator, it's largely about intuition. And that's when I realized that appeal has a lot to do with taste, or more specifically, what makes food look appetizing. There are some qualities that make a food universally appetizing or unappetizing, with just a fringe set of people making up the exception to the rule. On the other hand though, whether or not you find a food to be appetizing is highly subjective with a lot of variables in play. You could feel one way or another about a food based on how you were raised, your socioeconomic position, your culture, or even just how you're feeling that day. Some foods have broad appeal, but might not be good for you. Other foods are healthy. Some are an acquired taste or a very niche food. But it's not just the ingredients, but the way that a chef prepares and presents the food to you, the environment that you're served the food in. A talented chef can make something look good enough to eat despite you not wanting to try it before, whereas a poor chef can make you never want to eat a hamburger again. Now, what does any of this have to do with character design? Well, all of it does. Whether or not something is good or bad is sometimes separate from whether or not someone likes something or not. Now our jobs as character designers is not to choose the ingredients, oftentimes the ingredients have already been chosen for us, but instead it's to prepare and present those ingredients in a way that's appetizing or appealing. Some people mistakenly think that an appealing character automatically means a cute or attractive character, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. Just like there are more kinds of appetizing foods besides just sweet tasting ones. Now, any design that sells an idea like being scary, uh, disgusting, or even overly bland intentionally, like a bored office drone, that's all appeal. Now, even though the idea of an appealing character is somewhat subjective by nature, let's try and get some ideas on how to make our characters appealing. Robert Ryan Corey, in an explanation that he has since deleted personal uploads of, has an interesting theory for appeal essentially being the opposite of contrast well-executed sameness and balance versus well-executed differences. Others simply think of appeal as proper use of round shapes, which goes back to that idea of balance and the idea or correlation between an appealing character, meaning a cute or attractive character. In broad terms, you could also argue that appeal is just the successful merging of the other elements of character design, shape language, balance, contrast, clarity, and exaggeration. But if I were to make a more specific personal definition for appeal, it would have to do with flow, the way that the underlying construction pieces of a character move, interact with each other, maybe even point in a certain direction, all coming together to be cohesive, intentional, like they were meant to be together, a unified design. A few weeks ago while I was streaming over on the old twitch.tv slash bangledenizen, someone asked me about the characters in a game called Knack 2. Now there's two examples of characters in this game, one kinda good, one definitely not so good, when it comes to appeal at least. One of the main characters, I think they are, has a basic amount of flow from each part of their facial features, while another character has disjointed, boxy features that look a little uncanny. Now I'm not very familiar with Knack overall, but as for the main character's design, I think it's difficult to find appealing because there's a lack of unity and flow. Instead, it's just pieces that are all put together. Now I understand that that's the point, that he's assembled and grows from individual pieces, but it doesn't help that the larger version is just a larger clump of the same shapes. Now it's hard for this design to be appealing because it lacks that clarity and simplicity. The forms are not flowing together, they are pasted together. And instead of distilling a character down to a strong, potent assembly of shapes, it's the opposite. A byproduct of appeal can be a feeling of empathy, aspiration, or even loathing. Let's look at a few more examples. 
the latest version of Bumblebee has a lot more appeal than just the assembly of shrapnel that the other Transformers character designs are in the other live action movies. And it's not just subjectively appealing because I like Beatles more than Camaros or because he's rounder, but because there's some intentionality to the design and it's somewhat distilled. It's broken down into simpler parts. If the brief look at Starscream that we had is anything to go by too, it seems like they're learning their lesson about making the Transformers easier to digest visually and therefore easier to empathize with. Let's see another example. Look at the How to Train Your Dragon design for Toothless compared to the rest of the dragons in the first movie. Toothless is more appealing, more balanced, he has rounded features that allude to cats or dogs, and we empathize with him more as we see him bond with Hiccup. Whereas the other dragons in the movie though are a bit obtuse and harder to empathize with, and I think this was done for a reason. Not only is Toothless rare and special within this universe, but when we first see the dragons, they are at odds with humans. We're supposed to feel like they're the bad guys. This strengthens the impact that Toothless has when we meet him later on. You'll notice too that as the series progresses, newer dragon designs introduced after the first movie are more empathetic and appealing because we aren't as concerned with being able to trust them. I've mentioned before some thoughts on Funko's pop figure line, and it's not all the figures, but especially the human figures that I personally, subjectively, feel are not appealing. And it's not just the blank nature of the face, the soulless orbs that the eyes have, but the lack of cohesiveness between the eyes and sometimes a nose and the shape of the head. The eyes are spaced far apart, they look pasted on top of a flat face with no indents for the eye sockets, that's something again that goes back to Knack, there's a similarity there. And this is repeated through the most pervasive figure line in a long time, and it's usually staying the exact same on the human figures. I hate to be like a curmudgeonly old timer, but sometimes I really miss the late 2000s vinyl toy scene. Although I'm sure most people reminisce and yearn for the time when a part of the culture that they really strongly identify with used to be part of the counterculture and new and bold and different. That's not to say that there aren't nice entries in the pop figure line. In fact, this recent figure of the caretakers actually has a nice melding of the source material and the stylization of the pops. Now, because creatures tend to need a new mold, they usually have more leeway and get more creative designs. But notice how there's a flow between the much rounder features of the face. Now again, since appeal is largely subjective, some people will find character designs largely appetizing or visually appealing, and others will find them largely unappetizing or appealing. But if there's anything that you take away from this video, it's that a chef can't present a rancid, overcooked, oversalted mess of a meal and just claim that it's an unappreciated masterpiece. As an artist, that's what presenting undercooked or inexperienced art or overly obtuse or avant-garde characters is like. Yes, there's always going to be subjective differences in tastes and opinions, but try to at least aim for an audience and try to have a good understanding of what already appeals to that audience. Again, you're not trying to hide behind the idea of this is just my style. With this idea of appeal, you aren't going to have strict rules, but do try to guide yourself with some strong principles. This is what's really interesting to me about the current climate of cynical reaction to things that come out. And maybe it's just a defensive thing because we're so overly saturated with things that it's easier to process hot takes or knee-jerk reactions. But it's like it's become a race to find the best thing, as if every game or movie or show or thing that comes out was in a competition to be the best thing. And if it doesn't win, it's nothing. And the interesting thing is that in food, that's not really the case at all. Like, yes, there's this interest in what the best thing is, but people are often more interested in the authenticity, the variety of the food, and the overall experience that you have. Those things end up being more important. Which is why I think instead of setting such high expectations that are frankly sometimes entitled expectations, right? Uh, instead of going to the movies expecting it automatically to be the best restaurant in the world, uh, that's a jumble of the metaphor, I'm, I'm sure you figured out, um, and automatically just rejecting the thing if it's not the best, I think that instead appreciating each new experience for what it is will make a more enjoyable outcome where you're giving your compliments to the chef instead of starving to death for being a picky eater. That's me being 
I guess toxically positive, if that's even a thing. It's actually something that I've been thinking about a lot with myself recently that I've been working on, sort of changing the way that I view media and the things that we take in. That's it for me today. I'm making new videos every week on Character Design Forge. Subscribing on YouTube lets you know when new videos are made available. If you'd like to follow me on other platforms, my name is Bagel Denizen on Instagram, Twitter, and Twitch. If you'd like to support me on Patreon.com slash Bagel Denizen, like all of these lovely people are, you can get a lot of things in return, like the Novice Bard Critiques. These are personalized video critiques of your work, your artwork, that will help you level up in your skills and ability. Thank you so much for watching, and have fun creating!